بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. بمان داود ياشا نجا داودنا يا تلفزيون كا وين كلسن تي في وحن إذنك كسلامنا هو دا النجوا إذن الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. دمان تين. ما أنت أو أحد بيشا نوفمبر نا أيتها هاي شنية طبعاً ساعة دا مجلة لندن أو تدبدي يدور دقيقة وحين إنه بلا ما يا برنامج كي تدبد لها ها أت نوجا براتين أجرمت برنامج كعوضة وح مرتي إنه إنه جوا لبس صاحب أعد قدرين يقيم أقول إيه مجلة ذن آل كليرة هذا نجيب أحمد أو أ West London Initiative إيه جوان كونل أو أ Participation and Inclusion Manager هونزلو كامسل. برنامج كا وحن جعلنا هاي وحكوا بحدونا إنجليش وحن جعلنا هاي إنن انتي سبادن ايدين كوكو سوكد بنو لوقادا سوماليغا سيدي اولا سعوطان كويني انا مركاسي وصور تقلين اني كوفهمان لوقادا سي انجريسيغا فرس اف اول اي هاف تو ويلكم the two guests tonight مستر نجيب احمد from West London Initiative and Ms. Joan Kondler who is the participation and inclusion manager of Hanslow. Please welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks. Our program tonight will focus on prevent and United Kingdom government strategy on terrorism and radicalization. The first question would go to uh, the guests and I will start with Brother Ahmed. As we all know, Brevent is United Kingdom government strategy whose main aim is to stop people becoming terrorists or supporting terrorism. What can you tell us about this strategy from the day it began up until the present day? Thank you very much for the question and thank you for having us here today. Um, I do apologize. My uh, command of uh, Arabic and Somali is very limited, <laughs> so <laughs> we're going to have to carry the conversation on in English. Yes. Um, um, where um, uh, Prevent was started following um, the 7 7 bombings in central London, um, and it really is a strategy that was started by the then government, by the then Blair government, to try and provide a certain level of support to those communities who may have felt that they needed it the most. Um, um, it has come a long way since then, um, but Prevent in itself uh, forms part of the central government's contest strategy. I'll maybe pass it on to Joan, because uh, she's probably best placed to discuss the, 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 the roots of Prevent. Uh, Ms. Joan, what would you like to yeah, add? Yeah, I would actually say um, Prevent has actually been rolled out in Hounslow since approximately 2005. As Brother Najib says, it's part of the um, central government's contest strategy. And there's four Ps, protect, pursue, prepare and prevent. And clearly prevent is the one that we're discussing tonight. Um, as Najib says, it, it actually came about following the 7-7 bombings in 2005. And sadly, it's become blurred along the way in terms of the understanding of what the strategy was put in place for at a local level and tonight what we're going to focus on is what we in Hounslow are doing not necessarily from a central government's perspective we'd like to talk about what we at a local level are doing while touching upon some of the actual connotations that it's brought about for the Somali Muslims in Hounslow and those who actually travel across the world. Well that's, thank you very much uh, Ms. John, thank you Brother Ahmed. Thank you. Uh, well just the I think he, the prevent strategy is based, as you mentioned, on four areas of work. Uh, pursue, which means to stop terrorist attacks, detecting, investigating threats, threats, disrupting terrorism activities before it can endanger public. And also this involves prosecuting them. 
I think you also have another area of work is prevent, which mm -hmm. is responding to ideological challenges and the threat we face from those who promote these views. And the fourth is protect, which means <coughs> empowering the UK border security, improving protective s security for crowded places, mm -hmm. uh, and also reduce the vulnerability. Also, and the fourth is be repair, which is based on approach to emergency preparedness and the work at the scenes of major incident. Uh, uh, all these are uh, pieces of, of very good work. Uh, if, you, if I could kindly ask uh, uh, about the, the work you said you're going to be doing on the ground, w what kind of work that might be? Well, Prevent essentially is where we operate in this area, this dimension called the pre-criminal space. <laughs> So no offence would have been committed when we become involved in a particular concern or, or issue that's raised. Um, and really, um, prevent, like I said initially, prevent is there to provide support to not just the Muslim community, but to any other community that feels that it might need its help. Um, in Hounslow, as Joan says, we're, we're facing currently, for example, a, a rise in unfortunately far-right activity, and we can discuss reasons as to why that might be happening, hopefully later. Mm -hmm. um, and so currently the focus of Hounslow in particular, um, with regards to prevent strategy, is to target those who might be uh, susceptible, let's say, uh, to far-right extremist propaganda. Uh, yeah, and, and again to build what um, Brother Najib says, um, in Hounslow we are, we are faced with if you like a duality of where we've got 254,000 residents and the vast majority of them live in peace and harmony. There's a very small minute group who actually operate within our borough who seem to think that they can come to our borough and they can actually infect some of our younger people and by young people we're talking about an age range from 10 to 84 and um, with views that are not actually conducive to being a good British citizen. And I sit here speaking as an Irish person. Yes. So I understand the challenges that there are for people who've actually come here a long time ago, I've been here over 28 years, or some who've just arrived. And it's about skilling up everybody um, in terms of being resilient to the kind of extremist ideology that seems to be permeating the social media networks. We do that through the programme that we run out on behalf of the central government called RAP, which is a workshop to raise awareness around prevent. Um, we're rolling it out for frontline staff and I need to make this really clear. The prevent work that we do in Hounslow is not about spying on any one particular community group, any particular religious group. It actually aims, it's aimed at actually building up that critical reasoning and enabling frontline staff to understand when young people are vulnerable to being pulled in to terrorist related activity. And that's what we try and help them to avoid. Well, that's, that's a good point. I think he, um, if we particularly talk about uh, areas of threats, local threats, are there particularly uh, specific groups known to the authorities who are uh, operating, who might cause harm? Well, th there are, uh, if we talk strictly from an Islamic perspective, mm -hmm. then certainly there are individuals as well as groups mm -hmm out there who might not necessarily have the interests of our young people at heart and as Joan says young people we use that as simply as a term of reference yes um, the age range th of, of uh, the individuals that we've engaged with um, have been from a, a 10 year old up to a, an 84 year old mm -hmm. so, so just there are variations absolutely mm -hmm. a variation in age in ethnicity in cultural backgrounds um, in religions mm -hmm. yes um, so there's a huge variation um, of individuals that we've engaged with from a prevent perspective mm -hmm. and as Joe says like th from a Muslim community perspective mm -hmm. you know prevent has become a bit of a toxic term unfortunately yeah. um, and like we said um, uh, there have been times as with probably many issues many policies many many pieces of legislation um, even in our own lives mm -hmm. On a personal level, everyone makes mistakes. Okay, it's I, I feel that so long as Prevent has learned from those mistakes, which I think it has, ensures that it doesn't 
uh, that those mistakes are not made again. Um, and those who have made those, those mistakes are made aware of the fact that a mistake has been made. Um, then I think prevent is going in the right direction. Yeah, uh, yeah that, that's, that's a good point. I, I would like to say that uh, uh, there are questions. Uh, I personally believe that there were uh, objectives uh, and aims that has been there always. People know that this program's main aim was to protect the country, to protect the country, and when we say the country means everybody inside it, whether it's Muslim or non-Muslim or white or black, Christian or, or pagan, it means there are threats of various forms and shapes against different uh, segments of our community. Am, am I right? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. So I think that you have got the the, the, the threats of the far right, you've got the uh, British First, uh, uh, you've got the uh, English Defence League, you've got British National Party, all these have got vicious aims. And also there are people who are using distorted image of, of Islam and who might cause problems. And we have seen in the past and we are seeing in the present as well. Uh, my point is that, uh, is prevent failing to meet it is overall objectives? In terms of basic protection of British citizens with many terrorist plots uh, aborted and people suspected to have hand in those plans brought to justice, and many believe prevent is working. Many people, when they see that the number of plots that have been aborted mm. and those terrorists involving in those plots brought to justice, then they realize that it, it was a piece of work that has it is own merit. Uh, but when you look at, uh, in terms of affecting the hearts and minds of British Muslims who feel through the prevent they were alienated, demonized, stigmatized, prevent is largely seen uh, discriminatory and unsuccessful. Uh, I am not critical of this government piece of strategy. Uh, and uh, I just want to hear from your side as a people who have been in the f uh, serving the community and helping the community, uh, not only against threats of terrorism, but also helping them develop into successful community. What is your response to those voices saying prevent was largely alienating and stigmatizing the Muslim community. I'll, I'll let Joan touch on that um, initially and then hopefully I'll... I'll, I'll okay. I think the key thing to remember is anything that's actually handed from the top down, so from central government coming down to we, the local residents, is always going to come with some suspicion. And I say that, as I said, as an Irish person. Mm -hmm. But I, I genuinely believe fundamentally that the actual overall aim of the prevent strategy is to support and build resilience um, and to prevent our young people from going abroad and effectively not coming back. Yeah. That, that to me, if I didn't believe in that, I wouldn't be doing the job I'm doing. <laughs> Having said that, prevent has made mistakes. Yes. It's like with any new strategy, it's a learning curve, but sadly for us, the mistakes that we make are human ones and they impact on humans, i.e. our residents. And people don't forget. They have long memories. Yes. And therefore, when you're saying, trust me, trust me, and they give you their heart and their soul and they trust you, if you don't mind that trust in a careful way, you never get it again. And that's what we try to do locally. We try to say to people, you need to build up that trust with us. We will work to not let you down. But we are human. We do make mistakes. But one of the things I would say is that in terms of what we do locally, there's no shortage of experience and knowledge within our local Muslim community. Yes. And that's what we need to draw out. Yes. This is a strategy. It's only a document. It's how we actually apply it and we embed it at a local level is key. Yeah. And, and you wanted, for example, for Muslims, you wanted Muslims to practice their own faith peacefully in their own mosques, in their own homes, uh, openly without any fear in, in, in outside, and, and not feel victimized and by anybody. That, that is the, the, the idea. 
I think what we'd like to say to particularly the Somali community is you need to stand up for your community. Yes. You need to embrace the fantastic work you're doing here in Britain. Yes. And you need to actually send your children out of a morning feeling proud and empowered, not fearful and scared and concerned to get on a bus in case they're spat at or somebody talks about them badly. Mm -hmm. Young girls having hijabs pulled off them and being called names. Mm -hmm. We have to build up that resilience to say that what's going on across the world is being carried out by a very small, minute group of individuals yes. for whom Islam is not what they are actually doing under any name. Yeah, it is. It is. This is a distorted narrative. Yeah, From us locally, we're trying to work with the Somali community to say, step up, mm. be courageous, yeah. practice your religion. Yeah. It's a religion of peace. Well, thank you so much. That's great to hear. Uh, and and uh, Najib? Yeah, from my perspective, I think it's also important to, to realize yeah. that um, extremism in its current form, again, strictly from an Islamic perspective, yes. and because that is what we're here to talk about today, mm -hmm. because far right extremism and animal right extremism mm -hmm. also have issues, no doubt about that, and mm -hmm. there are roles and responsibilities that, um, uh, that sort of, let's call them the white indigenous, indigenous individuals have to play in that. Mm -hmm. But strictly from an Islamic perspective, we have to understand that violent extremism is constantly evolving. Yes. Um, unfortunately, ISIL, for example, have fully embraced social media yes. to, to their advantage. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to somehow use the prevent strategy mm -hmm. And it's a strategy, and we often make this point, Joan and I, that it's not an agenda, despite what media and others uh, may have you think. Mm -hmm. Prevent doesn't come with an agenda, a, se a secret agenda behind it, mm -hmm. to maybe suppress Muslims. It's not there to ensure that Muslims assimilate, mm -hmm. um, and if you're not a pub-going Muslim, then, in, then you're not British. Yeah. It doesn't say that. It doesn't work like there that. Is a, there is a general request for us to integrate, and I think that's a positive thing. Mm -hmm. um, is, is not giving up your values, is, is, is benefiting from the country that you came. Yes, absolutely. And I think we're fortunate to be living in the UK in, yes. in that it's one of the few countries mm -hmm. that has uh, embraced mm -hmm. our cultures and religions yeah. and has also benefited yeah. from that. Yeah. And I think it's a greater and more richer country for that. Yeah. Um, but c from an extre extremism perspective, look, um, it, it's constantly evolving, okay? Mm -hmm. it pu it's pushing safeguarding to its maximum sort of proportions at the moment. Mm -hmm. So we have to meet those challenges. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Definitely. Um, and uh, violent extremism, is, it, it has its changing faces. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, Al-Qaeda used to be the enemy. Mm -hmm. Now it's ISIL. Mm -hmm. And the, the irony of the whole situation is that uh, those who are affiliated with AQ, Al-Qaeda, mm -hmm. call ISIL terrorists. Mm -hmm. So the depravity that we see from ISIL mm -hmm. is also pushing new boundaries. Mm -hmm. And that is the challenge that we face. Well, definitely. And it's, it's a multiple challenge. Indeed. Yeah. I think uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, uh, people always listen, voices. I think there is a Emmanuel Hawke, a lecturer and author on British Islamic identity at the University of London. Uh, he said as a strategy, as a government policy document, it has not worked. The irony is that it has become counterproductive. The idea was to understand the roots of extremism, the roots of radicalization, by putting a magnifying glass across the Muslim community of Great Britain. What has happened? It, it has widened it, the, the gap between the Muslims as us and the British, the rest as other. I think it also th these, these are voices and opinions by people. But honestly, as you and John said, and we mm -hmm. know that the aim was to protect people uh, from harm. And I think uh, the harm is not only coming from one source, it's coming from different sources. Yeah. Uh, uh, th that's a good point. Uh, what I wanted to talk about is that terrorist organizations like ISIL are trying to radicalize and recruit young people through an extensive use of social media and the internet. Young people, some as young as 14, have tried to leave United Kingdom to travel to join ISIL and other terrorist groups in Syria and Iraq. How big and dangerous this issue is still is. And what are the most effective ways to address this problem? I think this is a very, very uh, uh, tough question. A lot of my friends and, and colleagues are saying 
why not children why not let children leave ports and seaports alone in the first place so i think he, how big is this problem and what are the uh, ways that the problem can be addressed please uh, okay sure. if i go first yeah, yeah. yeah. um i think w what uh, the main issue is that um, our young people currently um, are growing up with certain vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. okay? And these vulnerabilities, again, they've been there for years and years and years. It's not just the Muslim community mm -hmm. that suffer from these vulnerabilities. Yeah. You know, the issues of victimization, isolation, job opportunities. I mean, uh, 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 the Irish community for years and years and years suffered much the same. Yeah, but if we simply take the Irish uh, example, they've come out the other side. Mm -hmm. So there is light at the end of the tunnel th for those who feel victimized mm -hmm. yeah, through discussion, through understanding. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the ways in which we could probably um, address the issue mm -hmm. is by the work that we do, by going into schools, for example. And let's take that as a simple example. Mm -hmm. We go into schools. We educate the teachers, for example, and we say to them, OK, look, um, you have young people for whom you are responsible for that come into your classrooms on a more or less a daily basis during term time. OK, we think it's important that you try and understand what images and what videos, etc., they come across on social media mm -hmm. before they come into your classroom. Yeah. And we try and provide them with sometimes quite shocking, quite distressing images. So these young people are coming into classrooms with a fair amount of baggage. OK. So when uh, certain issues are raised in the classroom um, to which the, the teacher or uh, the tutor uh, doesn't have an understanding, that's where these vulnerabilities can be exploited because that young person will then go elsewhere to look for answers. But if we then educate our teachers and say, these are the type of images, this is the type of propaganda that these young people are seeing before they come into, their class, into your classes, I think it will make them a little bit more prepared to engage and discuss the issues that those, those young people might want to discuss. Uh. In addition, I think it's also important that we give the young people these, this thing called critical thinking skills. Mm. Because once they are... Um, they have an understanding as to how propaganda works, essentially how negative propaganda works, and how they might be, uh, their vulnerabilities might be exploited and, them, and they might be drawn into terrorism. Mm -hmm. Or any other vulnerability, for example, we have child sexual ex exploitation, mm -hmm. you might have gang membership, you may have similar vulnerabilities mm -hmm. that draw people into s different types of criminality. Yeah. So long as we give those the, them both parties, both the teachers and the and the, and the pupils, the students, mm -hmm. the skills to be able to uh, understand mm -hmm. and raise concerns mm -hmm. and ensure that we give them this thing called a safe platform where they're able to discuss the their issue, concerns, yeah. I think that's a step in the right direction. Well, definitely. I think he, uh, around 700 people from UK have traveled to fight for jihadist organizations in Syria and Iraq, according to police figures, half have returned to the country. 50 are believed to have died while there. What can you tell us about traveling to this troubled region? Many people are, as I said again, are putting question on the government, saying, is this an industry? Why you are letting children travel in the first place? And when it comes to the, the material, uh, the advert for the terrorist, why the service providers are not doing enough to remove. Uh, I have went into a re little bit of research and I found out since the terrorist group has intensified their online adv advertisement, there has been only 75,000 materialists removed. So why not bring legislation that puts pressure on service providers not to allow uh, any kind of this material to be uh, coming from their side. I think I'd like to mention two or three things initially, mm -hmm. um, if you don't mind, Joan. Oh the, okay. Yeah, the, the first thing is, uh, uh, surprisingly, those who are operating, ISIL aside, mm -hmm. those who are operating on the ground in Syria mm -hmm. don't want these young people to come to Syria. Okay. They themselves say, stay away. 
This oh. is not an area in which you should be coming mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, essentially a war zone, mm -hmm. okay? It's difficult life. It's absolutely difficult, but unfortunately mm -hmm. the propaganda from ISIL is such mm -hmm. that they sold this utopia of a Khalafa, mm -hmm. okay, whereby um, they, are, they will be allowed to live as practicing Muslims funnily enough, in the same way that they are allowed to live as practicing Muslims in this country. Mm -hmm. But then they sold certain creature comforts. There was a, an image that was put up online recently where um, uh, an ISIL fighter was holding up something as simple as a jar of Nutella, mm -hmm. saying that if you miss something even as simple as this, we can provide it to you. Mm -hmm. So their propaganda machine is working. But the reality on the ground is different. It's absolutely different. Yeah. Those, those who have returned and are allowed to return mm -hmm do certainly tell a different story. And okay. We have got a, a piece of uh, program that allows the audiences to see uh, what it means to be there and the effects. Yeah. We decided to leave just after the revolution, so we left at the end of 2011. My son Danny went back in to Homs uh, several occasions, and every single time was, was the same. It was just anguish and, and fear and, and, and living a constant life of, of horror. I remember going to the airport with him and just completely breaking down, and his sister broke down and his father broke down because we just assumed um, that we wouldn't see him again. And then we woke up the next morning, my husband and I, and I would automatically straight away to the computer, YouTube, and that was the whole family just sat there, you know, his brothers and sisters, literally searching for our son in a mass of dead bodies. That's what it was. The house was busy, now the house is empty. Honestly, sometimes I ask, Nasser, and he's not there. I start crying. I start blaming myself that I can't bring in people up. Mm. I expect behind the scene to see them, but honestly, I find just empty beds. young, British and fighting in Syria's war. Increasing numbers of predominantly Muslim men from the UK are crossing the border into conflict zones. There are no exact figures, but security sources have told me that up to 450 young British people have crossed the border into Syria, many of whom are feared to have joined extremist groups such as ISIS. Why well, was expecting Nasser is going to be a doctor and he's going to help the community. He will be working as GB or a consultant, and we expect high life. He was best of the best, but unfortunately, he chose the going with those wrong people and the wrong people lead him to the wrong way. I found about Nasser about four days after he left. He said to me he is going to a seminar in Shrewsbury received a phone call and he uh, told me, you know where is Nasser? I said, in Shrewsbury, he's supposed to come tonight, 10, 10 o'clock. He said, no, he's in Syria. You always in, in life need someone to rely on and uh, I relied heavily on my, on my brother really. I suppose my brother was really the best friend as well and I spent the majority of the time with, with him doing things. He brought so much happiness to all of us really. My brother was over in Syria for a period of six to seven months. He was carrying out humanitarian aid in the refugee camps. They were situated in the northern part of Syria, close to the border <coughs> of Turkey, where there wasn't so much mm -hmm. conflict or fighting. Uh, yes, we have seen some of the clips. If you could kindly explain the, the clips we have seen, uh, Brother 
Yeah, we, we work um, closely with um, the organization that you saw um, FAST, which is Families Against Stress and Trauma. Um, and they produced a video uh, addressing the issue of travel to Syria, for example. Mm -hmm. It seems to be one of the key issues that our young people are facing at the moment. Um, and um, the way in which we address it is show them real life examples of the effects of traveling to Syria. In that it's not, the effect is not just on the person traveling, but they leave behind, often leave behind families, friends, who can themselves become traumatized by the travel. Uh, right, by, by the disappearance of by their loved ones. Yes. Um, We've worked with uh, families who actually feel responsible, in part, um, for the travel uh, that their uh, uh, the, uh, family members have, have carried out. Um, but like we were saying earlier, I think it's important to understand the role of social media in all of this, um, in not just the travel to Syria, but the initial radicalization too, or potential to radicalization. Again, um, what we try to do is we try not to close doors when we speak with communities. <laughs> we try to change the terminology because we f uh, from, let's say, radicalization to grooming, for example. <laughs> and the simple reason for that is that the vulnerabilities that one may lead to be, that may lead for one to be groomed <laughs> are much the same as uh, those that may lead for, uh, uh, may the be much the same as, uh, as leading to, to radicalization of sorts. <laughs> so we try and t t change the terminology and what we get um, is community buy-in. Mm -hmm. um, but social media is also an issue that we face on a daily basis, Joan. Okay. And I, think, I think we need to take a step back and look at, you've got a far greater weapon, in inverted commas, than ISIS in the, f t in the way of a family. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why we were happy to come onto this particular TV programme, because what we have to ask the Somali mums in particular out there is to actually l look at where your children are accessing their IT, have you got a laptop that's in the bedroom that you don't know what they're actually looking at? Mm -hmm. Do you ever check the history of your child's online trawl through the actual internet? Mm -hmm. Are you aware and alert to what they're actually looking at and who they're engaging with? Mm -hmm. We talk about children turning up at ports with tickets heading to Syria. They had to go somewhere to buy those tickets. They had to check all that information out online. To prevent these individuals from getting their hooks into your young people, mm -hmm you need to be aware of what your children are doing online. But as Najib says, we have to talk about building up the resilience and the critical thinking skills amongst Somali mums and dads mm. and our children. Yes. So regardless of what ICE has put out there by way of their media spin, mm -hmm. the children can realize, no, I need to stay here. There's a democratic way that I can actually engage, I can change things, and I can make this evolve for the betterment of all people living in Britain. Well, definitely, thank you. I think we have got a, a call. Uh, okay, somebody tried to reach us. Well, I have got a television show. We have 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 a television Ms. John Conlon, a participation and inclusion manager of Hounslow Council. Brother Najib Ahmed, uh, West London Initiative. Labada Martida Inoa, Labada Ruha Martida Inoa, Wahan Kahadlini, Modu Muhima, or Kusabsan, prevent Eo, a strategy that the Lad in Greece, Kail, Wola de Rio, Argaki Hisada, Eo, that Hagir Nimada. Wahan Wedine, so Alla Dora, so Allaha, Wahakamidaha, and Mohan Nova Shegi Kirtan and Siasada and Ba Bernamichka Dola in Griska a prevent. Wahan Kalo Widine and Suasha Labad Wahan Widine Bernamichkani, a Kudak Meso, Dola the United Kingdom, Maya Hai Mid Markasi, Ujodun Kilo Abure, Mutkoha Kua Jehan or Kaso Bahaya Jibat Kisi. Wahan Kalo so Ka Belaunin and Kahadalno. أرجع حسا ده يعرورتا دعدا ير يجو عادية عراق يسير يعادية دعدا دو يرتع وحن كهذا الني إلا تضرب بقول الروح إن أي كت جان هل كانوا يعادين دول كاسي دجال ذا بعني كسو عدان يسير يعراق نص وحي كسو الله بتندلك كنتن وعي كدنت وحام مركز دم بعنو معناها جعلنا هاي إن 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 لا دعوة نفلنا a kilibis mujinaya, Baldulka la adeu, Iodat ka karkud, Oiso diarien, 
uh, and family against the uh, stress and trauma. Stress and trauma. Wa organization markasi so bandi geisa and dibatu yinka no a yihin iya sida laga gabi hikra. Wala li al nagala qayb qaata barnamijka su alihina na so wediya wa xan doonayna in wixi diba ya mashakil marba wixi jira an su ifti minu in hadana wa xan kuso laban ina in telefonat kuwa furan yihin just as we try to get the people calling us I would like just to talk about little bit about the children traveling to Syria okay I think the main question is that Okay. Somebody is calling. Please welcome. Hello. Hello. Ah, well, so the way we cut the program is called Gourmet Ekelson TV. Ah, well, what are you doing? Ah, well. What are you calling? So, hello, my boss. So, my name is Mohammed. My friend. Mohammed, we cut the way now. Ah, well. Pahang kalau soalnya bosaso. Bosaso, adi ada yang khusus dua ini na. Walau kan Muhammad. Abu Omar, hello asuman hari ini bukunya. Ah, wah, ibu Edin kata so asal tu, mai bernama macam kau hukum bahaya English walau. And. We will continue. Uh, Brother Najib, this is an issue that many parents are worried about. You have uh, children uh, whom you <coughs> believe are persuading their normal lives, going to school, college, or university. All of a sudden, you wake up, child, in, in the wrong part of the world. Okay. Uh, well, so the world, telephone, so the world. You have a uh, uh, your loved one disappearing into a, a difficult part of the world. Mm -hmm. So, what can be done to stop the? You have to wage a war on many fronts. Yeah, I think uh, that's where um, essentially prevent is at its best. Yes, because it works in what we call that pre-criminal space. Mm -hmm. um, what we have to understand is before these people travel, mm -hmm. a lot happens before they travel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello. Ha, well, I'll cut the wall. A barnamish ka gurmat a kalsan TV cut the wall. Ha, well, I'll cut the wall. Well, I'll cut the wall. How are you from Aliyatan? Ah, dia dua cut the wall. Na su ala le su asha. Ha, well, I'll wah kuidi. Ha. And ama kalo inkan wedin haya. Ha. And arur tu from Aliyat ola le yahi wa iskarhiyan. Ha. Umru ahay tu and kaja haya wadan ka ingiris ka kaja haya. Ha. أما عرور تحسير الدولد إنجليز إلا واحد كبر حياة أي ربوك أما دكتور دي كبر حياة ما الدولد ما يقبض عرور تصحيح حرته ما هو شيء جاي نضرب قلا قفة بحيو السوق رح يمر كل اللي عرور ما لقيش أي ربوك آه ولا الوا ما حسنت هاي وحكسها الناس لندن سما ها ها ولا العادي على ما حسنت هاي the mum is is she said I'm a Somali mother I would like to ask she said why why the children are allowed to leave the ports and seaports in the first place. Okay, why the government is not, even she uses the, the term rounding them up and, and taking them to jail. Why, why, they are, uh, why they have been allowed to travel? I think uh, very quickly, I'll touch on that and, and then uh, I'll pass over to Joan. Mm -hmm. We have this thing in this country um, called the rule of law, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. It's not as simple as, and we don't operate a dictatorship. Mm -hmm. Um, we don't operate in the way that many Muslims operate now, and Muslim countries operate nowadays, mm -hmm. where the moment you show dissent, mm -hmm. you're rounded up, and much in the same language that, that the sister was, use, was using, mm -hmm. you're rounded up and put inside mm -hmm. for an indefinite period, mm -hmm. 
and questions are asked later. Mm -hmm. We don't do that in this country. Mm -hmm. We operate this thing called the rule of law, mm -hmm. and that has to be respected. Mm -hmm. And it's often respected mm -hmm. uh, to the point where it causes um, an amazing amount of grievance to mm -hmm. uh, often media and political commentators. They don't like the fact that the, the rule of law operates in the way it does. Mm -hmm. But it's one of the core beliefs that we have. Mm -hmm. um, and so we need to operate within that particular uh, uh, role. Um, now, sorry, go no, on. I, I think okay. it means you're saying you cannot uh, uh, put somebody into uh, detention. You cannot no. detain somebody. No, but there is a, uh, we, the, the government, the central government, have brought out a piece of legislation that allows a parent to actually refer their children to the local police, and their passport can actually then be removed from them. Yeah. But how dreadful must it be for a mum to fear that her child is actually going to go abroad, so much so that she has to go and take those steps, which is where Najib and I hopefully come in. We talked about the work we do with the schools, but we also work with places like yours, like the Dar es Salaam and the Al Khan mosques in Hounslow. And we work with you and through your organisations to actually support young mums and older mothers who actually have got concerns. As Najib says, there's a rule of law that says if you want to leave the UK, you can do so. Otherwise, we'd actually be guilty of detention. Yeah, and that's not what we want to be doing. So the problem is that you have a freedom of movement Absolutely. laws that yes. you can't stop somebody who is old enough to travel. Whoever thought that we'd be talking about the problem of freedom of movement? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are taking another call. Please welcome. Hello. Hello. Hi. Well, I'm sorry. Well, I'm very much good. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Hi. I will also do a name. One could you make I go away? Abdi Hamid Smail has to go to London. Abdi walks on the way and I will walk on the way. Now, Modur Yer, Arurta, Behesa, Yakatarta, Elaine, we have a credit even Kurtuka, Elaine, Marco Horror, Arut in a Bahan Maha, Haru Hilo Industry, Washakala Kapsana, Yahawal Elinkara, Maha Amin Santa Walla. Okay, my friend, this is a good thing. I'm self Somali. What a lot you have, Jasha. English, I could tell you how to do it. Okay, if you prefer English. Okay, wow. Uh, 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 what the can make you leave it? I wrote to some other Harry, we hear you to enjoy Kuwait. ولكن <تصفيق> 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 If collectively, 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 community and uh, councils and the gov central government together, we can collectively prevent any child to go to the war zone. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. That, that, that is the message we would like to hear. You, you are saying uh, uh, back home, over 16, we were still responsible, uh, but here the law always encourages 16 and gives the person, whether a girl or a boy, a freedom to do things in, in their own. Uh, and I think he, you also talked about the advancement of the technology, which is also creating new troubles. And also 
lack of funding for various Somali organizations, uh, uh, the cuts have led to that, and that is also affecting. So, Sahma Hawal, ah, well, just he, he, he made a good point. He said, uh, back home, we're still responsible of our children mm -hmm. from the day they are born until they leave home and become married, mm -hmm. uh, responsible uh, 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 man or woman. Yeah. But uh, here, if the child reaches 16, he has feeling that he cannot be ruled. The other, the other thing the brother mentioned is the advancement of technology. The children are ahead of their parents. And the finally cuts, and, but he sent a good message saying that collectively, if we central government, the local councils, and the community work together, we can prevent children going to a war zone. That, that is his message. No, I, I, I absolutely agree with him. Um, uh, uh, the advancement of technology, including social media, which is what we've touched upon, <laughs> It, ha it knows no age boundary, it doesn't know of ethnic boundaries, religious boundaries, it is just there. It is very easy to access. Um, so certainly the advancement, or advancement of technology, where it has its benefits, mm -hmm. it also needs to be uh, controlled somewhat in a family environment, especially where there are young people. Yeah. Um, um, when we speak about collectively, um, I fully support that, but I think there, there needs to be mm -hmm. um, uh, a, 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 an understanding that by where we work collectively, yes, mm -hmm. but not where it might suppress discussion. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to allow for our young people to have a discussion, mm -hmm. raise their concerns, mm -hmm. because if they don't come to people like us, like Joan and I and yourself, mm -hmm. and, uh, and don't phone in and ask questions, mm -hmm. they will go elsewhere. But the other thing, uh, we have had uh, a sad event in Paris where innocent people uh, sitting in their own places who haven't done anything against anybody had suddenly been attacked by armed people uh, who just killed and created mayhem and fear. What do you think? I think it's important to point out that where we totally condemn the attacks in Paris, um, they are also having an effect on uh, Muslims mm. in this country mm. and probably across Europe. Mm. Muslims are feeling the effect of those attacks. Mm. And for those who feel that only those who have sort of foreign policy issues um, or are victimized and are isolated, the attacks in Paris actually dispels those myths because they are myths. Mm -hmm. I always make the point that if foreign policy wasn't an issue, mm -hmm. if victimization wasn't an issue, mm -hmm. those who seek to radicalize our young people will think of something else. Mm -hmm. And the fact that innocent people who actually were living and working and enjoying themselves in a very culturally diverse area of Paris, mm -hmm. um, innocent individuals mm -hmm. have been attacked. I rest my case when I, when I say that those of the ISIL and extremist ideology know no bounds with regards to depravity and those who they will attack. Mm -hmm. They also opera, uh, operate what we call now a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. There's a time when they were out to recruit young Muslims into their uh, ideology, their distorted ideologies. Mm -hmm. But now it's having a double-edged sword effect, which is it's not just they're not just recruiting young people, but they're also isolating non-Muslims from Muslim communities and, and, and association with anyone who might regard themselves uh, we, as a Muslim. We're coming to the end of the program. I would like to ask uh, uh, Chuan uh, uh, about the impact of these attacks. Whenever terrorist attacks happen anywhere outside the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. uh, it has a direct effect on Muslim uh, uh, yes. families and Yes. I have been told uh, this morning that uh, two young females uh, who were dressed in, in the hijab have come under attack in mm. Fulham. I think uh, a lot of people are keeping uh, those within themselves. They are not coming out and speaking against. I think the fear, there is a fear. Yes. What we should think the government, uh, the local uh, governments and the central government must do to uh, take these fears away from the minds and uh, of the people, uh, innocent people. I think uh, the millions of Muslims here are peace, 
loving and uh, I mean is law abiding, uh, law -abiding yes. citizens who whose main interest is to they are busy in their mm. own lives they 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 busy they working hard to make the end is meet they are not they have no time to, to for these things they they want to see their children develop and become lawyers mm. doctors engineers they want to become successful people so isn't a bad experience for those innocent muslims mm. to feel fearful about the backlash and what should the UK government and the police should do? Thank you very much, Ejon. I think, you know, firstly, I would say don't succumb to the polarization and the political divisions mm -hmm. in the wake of the dreadful Paris attacks, mm -hmm. because that's what the terrorists want. Yes. And that's the crucial thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of a local level, I mean, all we can do from a local authority's perspective is offer the support that sort of says, if you find yourself coming under physical attack, please contact your local police station. Mm -hmm. If your neighbours are becoming um, aggressive towards you, mm -hmm. give us a shout. There might be a piece of work that we can do at a local level mm -hmm. to actually bring around a greater understanding that you're not the cause of these incidents. Yes. I think I speak, as I said earlier on, and started this programme by saying I came here in the 80s um, at the height of the IRA. Mm -hmm. I'm pleased to say we've come full circle. Mm -hmm. And I really do feel it for the Muslim community and the Somali community in Hounslow. I know they're actually going through a lot of trauma. So you have the first uh, hand experience indeed, uh, of yes. being Irish yes, yes. and everybody was looking at you with suspicious eye. And, and the gift for me was I was white, but when I open my mouth, I've got an Irish accent, so it's a dead giveaway. <laughs> um, so there's those key things. But I mean, for, for people uh, you know, who actually pr practice the faith of Islam, yeah. you've got that outward appearance, mm -hmm. which you need, to re you, know, you need to retain the pride in. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what we would say to the rest of the communities of Hounslow is to be supportive. Mm. And remember, it's a, a small uh, percentage of the Muslim um, who've, uh, community who've mm. actually carried out these atrocities. Mm -hmm. um, you can't blame everybody for the sins of, of a few. But definitely. That, that, that is a beautifully done. Thank you very much for our audiences. I would like to thank uh, uh, Mr. Najib Ahmad and Ms. Joan Conner for coming to Kalsan TV and taking part in this wonderful program. We look forward to work with you and see you in the future programs. Uh, Udufaya, Dalkasi, Syria, Iraq, and Iyo, we hear Anka Kavankarna, Wahana Hide that Somalia, do Soka Hide, Dulka had the Anjuno, Ujedi and Unimit, Mayan and Ehen, Marnava, Arur in Tankudano, Arurteni, Ayuno, Uadan, Dulal Kalet de Gallo, Iyo, Mesha Sikuso de Tola, Marka Hanra Jenina, Bernamichka, and Ankuso Gavendoni in Tawa, Mat Santihin, Wahan de Kagatagena, Amana Allah, Yamana Rasul, and أوجس مهمة أيان جعلها هي إن تانا هو ذا كبحين بشا لحية لباتنكا نوفمبر تضبضة إن في نمو إلا إيه طبعاً كواحد جري دونا شروينة كده عدونا سفرن دي أور أوجس كا وحكلا سو أنكر تان تي في جا وحلا جا هذلا يا إن بريزن كونديشنز ااا and inmates of Somali background in in UK jails و 26 نوفمبر 7 to 10 a.m. Saffron the Ur. And we are going to be able to get the best of the best. Ahmed and John. In the future, we will be able to get the best of the best. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.